Okay. Okay, here we are. Welcome, okay. everyone. Hello from Italy, Florence. Okay. Hello, Florence. Hello. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Oh, from North Ma Macedonia. Okay. Macedo Macedonia, oh, I yeah. imagine. Because <laughs> no, Macedonia is the, is the Italian pronunciation. Okay. So, um, so good evening, everybody. I uh, hope everyone is okay and surviving the start of the school year. Um, I think it's uh, it's a busy period for 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 everybody, whether you're taking in sort of new students or new new children um, into your school, or whether you're continuing on with uh, classes that you already have. It's still always a new um, a new year. It's like the new year, isn't it? So. Um, Okay, so what what I wanted to do is just briefly sort of bring us up to up to speed, as we say, um, in terms of where we are in this very 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 general, let's say, um, conversation about um, environmental topics, um, and it is. Clearly, quite it is quite clearly a very broad, uh, very broad um, conversation here. Uh, last time we started to uh, we started to look at energy, and we started to I started to sort of link energy to global warming. Now, quite clearly, I didn't finish that. So, because the thing is, these topics are very big, and it's difficult to know exactly how much stuff you want to say and how much stuff you want to try and fit into a couple of hours. So um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to finish uh, this energy topic um, and I'm, going to, I'm actually going to take my time to do this because I, I don't want to rush it because I think this is, um, it's it's obviously very important um, from an environmental point of view and particularly now with this conversation the the, the conversation the global conversation is now finally t turning to uh, thinking about um, the the climate crisis and uh, what what needs to be done um, but from a let's say a technical point of view um, and it it's not to go into the deep science of it because the science of this stuff it can get quite complicated um, but it's to, just to give you some idea as to why certain things are the way they are okay so uh, you will see this as as we uh, as we um, as we go forward today. Um, if anyone has any questions, as I say, I have the chat open. I, I can't keep the audio open for everybody because it, it makes it difficult for uh, difficult to manage. But uh, please, um, please put the question, plus put any questions or comments on the chat and I will try to, I will try to answer things as we, as we go forward. Okay. Um, so today we're going to finish the we're going to finish the um, the energy global warming topic, and we're going to start probably if I if we have enough time, I will start to uh, talk about the uh, the plastics. Okay, so um, in general, what this means is that the timetable is slipping a little bit but having said that some of what we're talking about here will be taken from this topic here so uh, I think in the overall scheme of things we're we're actually okay for, for time we're just a little bit behind time okay so with that said Agnese has put a, a link on the chat uh, for the attendance so hopefully you should be able to get into the Google form and uh, do the uh, do the attendance that you need to do um, and if everyone is okay I'm going to uh, I'm going to sort of make a start pick up from where we got to last time and we talked about lots of different things uh, we talked about energy balance we talked about the Sun blah 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 just excuse oh here we go right 
Okay. And we, I think we stopped here. And the, the, the whole thing about this, let's say, this nexus between, or the con this connection between energy and, uh, and global warming or climate change is, uh, I think it, it's, it's obviously it's a key it's a key topic um, when we're talking about the environment and in particular man's man's or people's relationship with uh, with the environment and it's very easy for this topic to get extremely technical very very quickly such that people who are maybe not um, who don't have a scientific background or a technical background <coughs> find it um, difficult or obtuse or just impenetrable okay um, but what I hope to try and sort of get across uh, what I ho hope to try and get across in this session is um, how certain there are certain aspects of this let's say this topic which you can see and which do link to everyday life so it's not something which is let's say out there and theoretical and what have you it gets difficult when you start to try and put numbers on things um, because that means you have to get into detail and the detail in some cases can be quite can be quite complicated. Also, the numbers, and I think we saw this a little bit last time, <clears throat> the numbers which we're talking about um, can be, well, uh, so abstract <laughs> that it's difficult to it's it's difficult to 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 reason around what these numbers actually mean. So, if I said to you, uh, well, we said last time. Um, the Earth receives 170,000 terawatts of energy in a, in a, um, I think it was in a year or in a day. I can't remember, but anyway, um, that number is just so huge. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter whether it's a year or a day. <laughs> it's just so huge that it's, it's almost beyond, uh, well, it is beyond our, way of thinking about it. You can't convert it to, uh, oh, that's the equivalent of however many 1.5 volt batteries, something that you can see, or it's the equivalent of a number of elephants. It, it doesn't work like that. The numbers are too big. Okay, so that said, um, what I'd like to introduce is this idea of um, different ways of thinking about energy and I think this is this is interesting because it's um, it's something which is present and it's around us, but probably we don't give it much thought. Um, you may ask the question, well, why think about energy in this particular way? Um, and the answer to that question is, well, it helps us um, it helps us break down into useful chunks, useful pieces, the um, this very, very, let's say, uh, superficially easy but underneath very complex system which involves getting the energy from the sun to uh, into your car or to power your telephone, okay? So, um, I'm just going to walk, I think this slide is, is, uh, is a useful summary of this because remembering that most of the energy on the earth, uh, in the earth system, in the earth system is derived from the sun. Um, relatively little is actually coming from the earth itself. It, you have geoth some geothermal energy, some energy from radioactivity, um, which is causing heat in the rocks, but it's actually relatively small. It, in fact, it's very, very small compared to the amount of energy which we actually receive from the sun. So 
thinking of the sun as the let's say the principal uh, the principal driver of everything um, we can look at different types of, of energy um, and the first thing that we come across is the idea of something which is a flow and something which is a fuel so the flow will be something like wind or solar energy um, but I'll explain that in a minute um, fuel is literally something that you can put in a container of some description and carry somewhere else okay so it's some it's a, it's a, it's like energy in a box if you like um, now thinking about how do we get uh, how do we get from the energy uh, source or the energy source to the end use okay um, we have a set of let's say pieces of this process of thinking so the first thing is to think about um, how is this energy collected so this is a harvesting technology if you like um, obviously if we're talking about wind we'll be talking about wind turbines if we're talking about oil we'll be talking about oil rigs or oil derricks some way of extracting the uh, the oil from from under the earth now at this point I think that's 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 sort of fairly clear but at this point there's another concept which I think is very useful uh, to, to think about energy and that's the idea of energy currency now if you think about money if you think about cash okay whether you're thinking about uh, about euros deutschmarks francs lira drachma whatever the advantage of cash is that you can you can go into a supermarket and you can buy anything and you can exchange your cash for that thing so the idea of the of an energy currency is let's say um, that you have a form of um, transmission of the energy or a form to transmit the energy which is independent of where it comes from so if we think about if we think about electricity well I think we mentioned last time that electricity can come from hydropower wind power it can come from a whole a whole series of different a uh, whole series of different sources but it, the source doesn't matter once you have the electricity the source doesn't matter because it's like you've got a hundred euros yeah as, as long as you've got the as long as you've got the cash you can you can buy whatever you want you can buy a hundred hundred euros worth of coca-cola if you feel like it okay um, and so the same goes for uh, an energy currency like well here it says gasoline but uh, oil for example um, so in other words this typically we would associate it with an oil derrick but um, a fuel of this type a hydrocarbon could be derived from a biotechnological process so and it's independent but how and how you use it is also um, let's say independent of where it's come from so you can use excuse me you can use electricity for many many different things uh, just as you can use fuel uh, hydrocarbon fuel for many many different purposes okay so we've got this idea of a currency it's something which is um, uh, allows you to transmit but is flexible in in the transmission okay so thinking about electricity of course we have to get it from the harvesting to the people uh, or to where it's going to be used so this is distribution again this is a technological thing um, so in the case of electricity it's easy we think about wires we think about pylons we think about electrical cables um, in the case of oil an oil product we think about pipelines we think about tankers uh, big ships trucks okay um, and so we have a so we have a, 
um, you can see how there's like a, a supply, well, to use the, the term, the supply chain of, uh, of energy. Okay, so um, from the distribution, you can you then uh, you can then think about well, how is this energy being um, how is this energy being used? Okay, that that's not the same as what is it being used for, but how is it being used? Um, and this is in the in the, the parlance of the uh, people who uh, study these uh, these flows of energy. They talk about um, surface technologies. Now it sounds a little bit technical, but it simply means it's the machine or it's the thing which allows you to do what you want to do with the energy. Okay. Now usually you don't think about you don't usually don't think about your picking up your phone and you don't usually think about your phone as a um, as something which is using energy until it until the battery runs out. You pick up your phone to do something. So in this case, uh, you may pick up your phone or you you may open your computer to send uh, an email or to talk to someone, and that's the service that it's offering you. But the technology, the, the ser but the the thing itself is a technology. The the computer, the phone, whatever is a technology which is allowing you to uh, which is allowing you to use that service okay same thing for a car we don't usually think about cars as a service um, but in a let's say in a in a technical sense it is because it's a way of moving from one place to another so it's providing you with an um, an intangible which is the the, the transport in a in a particular form. Now, why is it useful to think about the energy system in this in in these terms? Well, you can by breaking it down, you can start to see. Well, okay, um, what about if we take the oil? Um, what about the extraction? What about how the oil is used? What about the distribution? Um, which obviously you can see that there are, well, we know that there are uh, potential problems with these. What about the use of the uh, the service? So, for example, cars, uh, too many petrol cars, and so and too many petrol cars which are not uh, which are not efficient enough, and uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see that by breaking um, breaking the, the the thing down into manageable chunks you can get a better idea about how we can actually go about um, uh, go about modifying the system because this is that's essentially what we will be talking about if we're going to move into a situation where we where we are dealing with um, just one second uh, where we, we are dealing with um, uh, sort of changes to habit and changes to the way we do things then we have to think about well if I'm not using my car what are my alternatives okay so you can see how it uh, it can start to ask uh, start to answer uh, or start to help you answer questions okay so uh, Christina about harvest technology today I was to bad news enormous spill from an oil well in the middle of the California yes okay yeah th that was another uh, I, I haven't heard, I haven't read the details, but I heard that there'd, there'd been an oil spill, for example. So, for example, it's clear that these, uh, some of these things do have major impacts on the uh, on the environment. Okay, so so that's I think that's an overall picture of the um, uh, of the, let's say the energy of an energy system um, but thinking about um, thinking about the let's say the uh, components within this about where we actually get energy and I'm coming back to the, the first part here uh, or this part here um, sorry this part flow and fuel okay so if you think about uh, fuels, fuels are, as I said, are relatively easy to uh, imagine. It's a, it's a, it's a 
it's a liquid, a solid, a gas, which contains energy within its chemical structure. And what you're doing is you're doing some form of chemical transformation to get that energy out. The chemical transformation is typically combustion, although in the case of uranium, it's, <coughs> it's nuclear fission. Okay? But the point is that you're getting energy out of the structure of the material. Okay? The other way of getting energy is through flows. And fl flow, well, we typically think about um, uh, think, think about rivers, uh, hydroelectric uh, water, uh, hydroelectric um, energy, which is uh, generated by flowing water. But uh, it it also applies to things like uh, solar power, uh, photovoltaic. Um, installations in particular because you are still interrupting a flow of um, in this case in that case it's light energy which is uh, interrupted and in some way what you're trying to do is you are trying to um, uh, take off uh, cream off uh, some of that uh, some of that energy so that you can use it okay um, the big difference is that um, obviously the big difference between a fuel and a flow is that a fuel you have to get, uh, you have to extract in some way um, with all of the problems that that entails, whereas a flow um, is typically associated with a place. Okay, so there are geographical, uh, geomorph geomorphological constraints on flows which are not constraints on fuels. Classic example is that um, a solar a solar power system is not going to work very well in the north of Finland um, because <laughs> for a lot of a lot of time of the year there's going to be no there, there's going to be no sunlight. Uh, at the same time we are all fully aware that oil, a lot of the world's oil is located in particular places and it is transported and so coming back to Christina's example of the uh, of the oil spill, why is there an oil spill there? Because there was an accident involving something which was transporting the oil from one place to another. Okay, so um, Thinking about fuels, thinking about fuels themselves, um, the obvious examples are petrol and gas, um, and these are used to provide the energy for the for the services which uh, we ultimately derive from that energy. So whether that is heating our houses, moving us around, uh, giving us light, okay. Uh, these are uh, fuels are um, highly um, transportable, uh, highly transportable um, repositories of energy. These are typically uh, now. There's a technical. This is this 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 paragraph is a little bit technical in the sense that um, the primary so energy source would be the sun. But for most purposes, we talk about um, we talk about the fuels, as in the hydrocarbon fuels, as being um, primary sources, simply because they are the first things that we find when we dig up, uh, dig them up. Um, obviously, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of how they got to be uh, uh, fossil fuels. Um, they were uh, plants which did take the energy from the sun, but millions and millions of years ago. Okay, so uh, I think we saw last time uh, a couple of graphs which showed that um, around about, well, we're still about 90-95% of energy uh, used across the world is coming from primary fuels, which is uh, the hydrocarbons. So that's coal, oil, gas. And we use these for, use this energy for just about everything. Um, we have, um, wherever you see a motor, which is not attached to a plug, 
Okay, wherever you see uh, um, heaters which are uh, burning things rather than just giving out heat, um, you are certainly looking at the, uh, the use of primary uh, primary fuels. Um, and most energy uh, to generate electricity is used, it comes from fuels. So if you remember, although hydroelectric uh, and solar and wind are becoming, particularly solar and wind are becoming more, uh, more uh, present, still the large majority of electricity is generated by burning fossil fuels. So this is something that we really do have to uh, really do have to be thinking about. Um, if we think about <coughs> different types of fuels, um, so the nuclear fuels, the biofuels, the fossil fuels, we consider these as primaries. Um, the whole thing, and I think I've sort of alluded to this before, is that there is a chemical there is a chemical transformation, and it's the chemistry which is the limit to this in the sense that um, you can you can have sources of fuels which are sustainable uh, in economically sustainable or let's say atom sustainable in terms of they, they go around in a circle but um, biofuels still produce carbon dioxide when you burn them um, if it's done in the right way, it's 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 neutral in the sense that it doesn't add to the uh, it doesn't add to the the total of the the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But you cannot avoid you cannot avoid that it's a process of combustion. Okay, the chemistry is what it is in the end. Um, so. Uh, Whenever you have combustion, of, in whatever form, you are making carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, which is bad news, um, and water, <clears throat> and you're releasing the energy. So the whole point is to get the energy out of that, out of those molecules. Um, but it comes down to chemistry. Um, as far as oil is concerned, um, you know that oil comes from under the ground or under the sea it's uh, it comes out as a as well it depends on where it is in the world actually um, there's it's there's a whole science about um, preparing uh, crude oil for uh, for separation it's actually quite uh, it's actually quite complex quite complicated but the thing is that essentially you have a mixture of stuff and this mixture is distilled um, at high temperatures and from the distillate you get different what we call fractions different parts which can be used for different things so you have um, the lighter fuels like uh, gasoline and kerosene come off and then you have diesel and then you have the heavy diesel um, and you have the bitumen the tar products now um, none of this none of this goes to waste because the uh, let's say the, the heavy fractions are used in uh, are used in industry for well, for plastics and for other things as well but they are the they are the raw materials of many many things that we take for granted in uh, in our let's say in, well in our everyday life including including medicines so um, you can see that the the thing is actually quite uh, it's quite a it's quite a web it's quite an intri an, an intricate connected uh, web. Um, we have gases things like well typically methane which is maybe mixed with other other gases butane propane um, typically found together. These are decomposition products during the fossilization and they may dominate over the oil or they may be found with the oil um, and they too uh, gas is used uh, is used as a as a, a primary fuel and you burn them and you get carbon dioxide 
So even the idea of uh, switching your car from uh, diesel or petrol to LPG or methane or whatever, it's just uh it's just the it's just the same stuff it's all carbon in the end you're burning carbon <laughs> okay so um we have to we have to look for look for alternatives so one of the alternatives which is touted is uh, hydrogen um and i'm sure that everyone here has heard of hydrogen as a possible fuel um and it will, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but it's a, it's a potentially useful energy currency. Um, but it doesn't actually occur naturally on Earth, simply because it's a very light gas and Earth's gravity is not strong enough for, is not strong enough to, to keep it in the atmosphere. And so um, hydrogen has to be, uh, has to be made. Um, how do we make it? Well, it can be made from water or methane, um, according to what type of process you're using. Uh, but this requires energy, and it re requires lots of energy. And so the question then comes back to: so where does that energy come from for you to make hydrogen? It makes no sense to use to burn oil to make hydrogen because by burning oil you still put the CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay so um, energy density uh, may be slightly technical but not so technical and I think you can appreciate that um, that some fuels, some sources of fuel will have more capacity to give you more energy uh, in a small volume. So uh, the example here is uranium, um, not something that we typically carry around in, in our pockets or have in the house, but it's an extremely energy dense uh, material. Um, and it's such, it's, I think it's on the next slide, not, okay, no, it's a little bit later, but um, small pieces, small relatively small chunks of uranium have uh, much higher much contain much more potential energy than um, the equivalent uh, the equivalent amount of material uh, of hydrocarbon fuels okay um, the difference between something like uranium and something like oil or a fossil fuel is obviously that uh, during the processing to get the energy um, you don't produce greenhouse gases you don't produce carbon dioxide um, and so <coughs> this is obviously a potential advantage which is one of the reasons why we are starting to hear about um, uh, the, the idea that maybe nuclear uh, nuclear energy is going to uh, is going to play a bigger role in the conversion towards um, uh, the core conversion towards gr the green economy, let's say. Um, but of course, as we know, there are downsides associated with the use of uh, things like uranium. Um, okay, so in terms of the fossil fuels, this is a this I don't know whether you've ever seen these these are quite incredible machines um, uh, if you ever go up the Autobahn between um, good lord where is it Stuttgart and you go up towards northern Germany so you're going up towards Mainz in that area at a certain point um, there is an area which is, uh, which is basically, it's the, I think it's the largest open cast coal mine in Europe, um, and it's a huge, uh, it's a huge, a huge, huge area in which basically the topsoil has been removed, and underneath, 
and it's relatively close to the surface, which is why it's called an open cast uh, coal mine. Um, underneath there are layers of uh, carbon, layers of coal, and they use these machines, which here you don't really get an idea of how big they are, but they are absolutely enormous. They're almost like something from a cyberpunk science fiction film. Um, okay, so apart from, let's say, the, the technical marvel, um, there's a lot of environmental damage here. Um, also, the type of coal which is being extracted is extremely poor quality, or it's relatively low quality. Uh, it's lignite. And that means it's, co it's coal which contains uh, carbon, some, carbo um, some hydrocarbons, but <clears throat> there's also a lot of nitrogen and sulfur compounds. And these are, uh, these are the elements which start to cause problems when we, uh, along with the CO2, when we burn this stuff. Okay, um, clearly we can transport oil, oil and uh, liquid petroleum gas over uh, long distances, uh, typically by pipeline or by tanker. Um, liquid petroleum gas is actually relatively easy to compress, um, but it's uh, and it's it's relatively easy to, to and it's relatively easy to uh, transform. But of course, when you burn this stuff, um, in particular when you burn lower grade uh, coal. So that's the uh, that's the the, the car. Well, in Italian it's called carbone, but in in English it's coal, which is because it's not it's not pure carbon. It's it's a mixture of stuff. It's that it's that black rock, um, and that typically does contain the nitrogen and the sulfur, which when they burn, they give you the noxes, perhaps the nitrogen oxides, the sulfur oxides. Um, these are the things which cause acid rain and they cause um, uh, severe <coughs> uh, respiratory problems along with other stuff along with the volatile organics um, and in the heavy uh, in the in the coals like the the lignite uh, which has a, a certain amount of hydrocarbon stuff in it there are um, polyaromatics, there are all sorts of things which are really quite, let's say, um, potentially, uh, potentially dangerous, uh, potentially hazardous. So of course this is all sort of um, uh, all around the, let's say, the, the environmental impact of this type of, this type of activity. And of course where you're extracting um, you're typically destroying habitat and it's easy to say oh, well who cares no one lives there <clears throat> but uh, one of the things which is starting to become more and more apparent is that destruction and destruction of habitat loss of biodiversity in general is a bad thing because you have um, knock-on effects in the food chains and we talked about food chains a long long time ago um, but there's a whole set of uh, there's a whole set of connected uh, connected problems okay um, a couple of words about a couple of words about biomass um, so biomass is is a term which is typically used for um, things like biofuels um, and plant-derived uh, biofuels. Um, the difference between biofuels and fossil fuels uh, are simply time in the sense that um, if you're talking about biodiesel or bioethanol, which is just ethanol but it's made in a, let's say, in a biological uh, biological way um, these are these are hydrocarbons uh, which um, which have not come from a fossilization process okay so that's the that's the big difference so it's just the time for the fossilization um, but the thing about the biomass is that it's considered a renewable source because 
although you harvest the plants, you then you, you you're co constantly replanting. So um, this is something which you you read quite a bit about uh, the potential for replacing um, the potential for replacing uh, some. Uh, some uh, hydrocarbons, particularly petrol uh, and diesel, in uh, in cars, with these types of additives. Um, I think there was a report just a couple of weeks ago of um, of an aeroplane. Um, I can't remember where, where it was. I would have to have to try and find it. Um, which, for the first time, was being flown using um, recycled vegetable oil. Which is quite a, which is quite an achievement. Okay, so uh, this is a, a rather complicated diagram, but basically it sums up the, the situation. Um, Biorefinery is a very generic term for any type of um, any type of industrial plant which is taking in. Uh, plant input in one form or another and or organic input in one form or another and converting it into something which is um, which is then used in uh, let's say in the green uh, as a green product in the economy so just giving give the example so we've got sugar uh, we've got sugar beet sugar crops coming in uh, they can obviously be <laughs> Uh, they're obviously going to be the, so the, 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 the source of sugar, but they can also be the source of ethanol through fermentation. Um, and the ethanol can uh, be used for producing, well, it can be used for producing CO2. It can be used for, um, as an additive in petrol. Uh, it can be used in different types of chemicals. It can be used in food. Um, so you can see the whole thing, or you can burn, you can burn stuff and get energy. Uh, starch, which is amido in Italian, um, this is a uh, this is undigestible um, um, sorry, this is a, uh, this is a, a, a polymer of, um, of glucose which is used by plants as, a, as an energy source and which can be um, which can be extracted so for example potatoes are full of starch uh, some some foods are, are full of starch um, and this can be used as a basis of bioplastics for example so you get the idea that there's a uh, there's a, a range of inputs and a range of potential outputs okay um, there's no one um, there's no one thing which dominates and maybe that's a good thing because um, it's easy to pick up on our ah, hydrogen will save us no bioethanol will save us no nuclear will save us Actually, you probably need a <coughs> you probably need a mix of stuff. Okay, um, but there are there are also some co other considerations to make about biomass, um, and that is that um, sometimes it depends on what you're what you're growing, but sometimes the the biomass actually competes directly or indirectly with food crops so first of all there's the li there's literally the space where the the crops grow of course uh, crops need fields or space to grow in um, and in some parts of the world um, where space is at a premium the choice is do I grow it for fuel or do I grow it grow it for for feeding people and the answer to that choice is quite often based on the economics of it so um, this was about five or six years ago. The uh, the U.S. government started to subsidise um, corn production for making bioethanol, and that had the knock-on effect that farmers would sell their corn 
to ethanol producers rather t than to food producers and that had a knock-on effect to uh, increase the price of tacos quite considerably in Mexico. So this is this is the sort of uh, the sort of thing we have to be very careful that um, we look at we look at how things are connected here because it's it's too easy to say yes okay let's do it. everybody use bioethanol and we'll be fine okay that means that someone won't be uh, eating tacos yeah and when that's a staple food when you're talking and quite often these crops are staple crops um and not you know not luxury crops i mean tacos in europe is a luxury type of thing it's not a staple but um it's these things can have big effects on uh on local markets okay so ah yes right okay so um i so, thought i'd try and lighten this up a little bit by um, introducing, <laughs> introducing a few musical references. Um, now, for the younger ones of you guys, uh, uh, who are here, uh, you probably don't re will probably not recognise any of these. Um, but for maybe for the older people, um, some of you may recognise things. Uh, some of the references. So this was um, a reference to uh, an album by Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, a group from the 1980s, uh, electronic music, um, but very, let's say, uh, quite poppy. So it was quite they they did very well in the in the charts, and one of their albums was called Enola Gay, and of course Enola Gay was the name of the um, uh, the name of the aircraft which was used to drop the first atom bomb on Hiroshima. So we're going to talk about nuclear energy here. Just a, a few extra words about it. Um, so thinking about uh, thinking about what I was saying about energy density, if you can imagine a piece of metal, uh, quite heavy metal actually, because uranium is very dense as, a, as, a, as an element. It's near the bottom of the periodic table, so it's... Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of protons and neutrons there. Um, a, si a piece the size of your fingertip um, is the equivalent energy of well uh, 800 kilos of coal, um, nearly 600 liters of oil. So that's a lot of energy. Um, now, my question would be this is the energy you get out but how much energy do you actually need to make all of this but that and then manage what happens afterwards but uh, i haven't been able to find any information about that okay um so you have typically uranium 235 that's the famous one uh plutonium 239 is plutonium is also uh, quite well known um but of course these elements have um just to mention the names uh, is is quite uh, you talk you, you you think about danger. Um, so the use of, of nuclear does depend on where you are in the world. Some countries have uh, made a a choice back in the 70s and 80s to. Um, for various reasons to to use nuclear, uh, France, Japan, and Canada are uh, perhaps the most successful in terms of how they've incorporated nuclear into their energy mix. Um, other countries have abandoned nuclear power. So I'm thinking about, uh, for example, Germany and. Uh, uh, Italy, uh, who uh, here there was a referendum uh, to stop the development of uh, nuclear. Uh, I think it was during the 70s or 80s, maybe the 80, 1980s. Um, but of course, the downside is the downside of, the, of nuclear is the is the cost. Um, there's the upfront cost of actually developing the technology, because this is not trivial technology. Um, the cost of getting hold of enough uranium or plutonium, well the plutonium is usually made from the uranium, um, and then there's the cost of actually managing this stuff and the waste which is produced. And just to 
I think I'll just move on, jump jump two slides, and I'll go back one, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, we know we know that um, radioactive waste is dangerous, and we know that it's around for a long time. But maybe we don't really have much of an idea about how long this is, because it's connected to this idea of half-life. Um, now. When I ask students about half-life, um, everyone says they've heard about it, but very few people actually know how to explain it or to say what it actually is. But not to get not to get technical, but this is a, a useful way of thinking about it. Imagine that you have one kilo, one kilo, so um, a bag of sugar, yeah, radioactive sugar, with which is not sugar, but it's plutonium two three nine. In 24,000 years, you will have 500 grams of your plutonium sugar and 500 grams of something else, okay? So in other words, this stuff is, you've still got a lot of it. And in another 24,000 years, you will have 250 grams of your plutonium sugar and 750 grams of something else. But the point is that this plutonium stuff is sticking around. So if you think plutonium is bad, well, you just have to look at iodine, the iodine 129, 15.7 million years. Okay. So um, these are time scales. Well, even looking at the plutonium, um, these are time scales which uh, civilization has not been around for 24,000 years. <laughs> so um, this is, I think this is an example, it sounds, it looks like an example of really, let's say, kicking the can down the road, like a long way down the road. It's going to be somebody else's problem. But coming back to uh, this slide, um, one of the things about nuclear waste is being able to find a safe place to keep it. Um, and that very much depends on which country you live in. Um, because, of course, what you want is you want a place which is, if you want something to, to be kept for hundreds of thousands of years, it needs to be in a place which is extremely geologically stable. And uh, that means that you need to be on a, you need to be in a country which is on a continent, or <laughs> the middle of a continental shield, uh, not at the edges. So, um, this this can also be a problem. Um, so if we think about public perceptions of nuclear energy, um, three names come up. Certainly the first two will be familiar. Uh, everybody knows Chernobyl, everybody. Uh, Fukush Fukushima is something which has happened recently in the last is it 10 years or so. Um, and there's another one. This one is from the 1970s, 1980s, Three Mile Island, which is in the US. Um, these are all, all associated with really bad um, radioactivity leaks into the surrounding areas. Now, the difference between Chernobyl and Three Mile, and, uh, Three Mile Island compared to Fukushima is that Fukushima is a was caused by an earth the, the leak was caused by an earthquake to tsunami whereas chernobyl and three mile island were caused by human error okay that's not to excuse excuse what happened in fukushima but it's just to give a give a context so um you don't want to be you don't want to be making this stuff doing doing this stuff in places which could be potentially um uh, potentially prone to um, earthquakes or um, uh, geological phenomena which could uh, disrupt the uh, disrupt the integrity of the reactor okay um, the other the, the, the other thing about nuclear and this is well it is banal in a way um, all of this technology what do you do in the end you superheat water to make steam to drive a turbine <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so it's uh, it looks it, it seems to be an extremely a complicated way of uh, of driving uh, driving a turbine to make electricity. But why do why do people do it? Well, they do it because it's um, you get a lot you get a lot of uh, a lot of energy to a lot of steam to drive the tur drive the turbines. So that's the reason. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to I'm going to look at uh, something about energy flows now. Um, so one of the what I think one of the things about energy flows is um, we've all sort of put our hands in flowing water when you put you put your hand under the tap. You can feel there's a force, and so of course if there's a force, there's energy. And in the case of the tap water, there's the pressure which is forcing the water out, but it's also falling, so there's there's gravity. So um, the interesting thing about the uh, about the energy flows is that you don't have the same technical constraints in terms of thermal efficiency as you have in an engine. What does that mean? Um, if you if you if you think about uh, if you think about your car or your uh, your motorbike, um, you drive around, and then maybe you need to you realise you need to put some water in the windscreen wipers. So you open you know you 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 you, you park and you open the you open the bonnet or you open the hood as the Americans would say. And you look for the you look for the place where to put the water, but of course the engine is hot. The engine can be very hot actually, um, and you have to be careful. In fact, some cars these days don't let you open the hood until the engine has cooled down. Um, so if you think about it, that energy, that heat, is wasted. You have warmed up a part of the car that you don't need warm because it would be better if it were the the place where you're sitting, no? Um, or you've warmed up your surroundings, um, and this is a byproduct of the combustion process which you're actually using to propel the car. So this is a, an example of something uh, of one of the big problems with uh, the internal combustion engines which is that um, they have limited efficiency they will always lose heat they will always lose energy to heat okay whereas when you're talking about energy flows or getting energy from an, an energy flow like a river um, you don't have an engine you're not burning anything so you don't have that inefficiency which you're going to lose uh, in which sorry in which you're going to lose energy uh, as uh, as heat okay hold on i'm just and yes it's just uh, uh, yeah okay so just just i'm just going to uh say one thing about uh Agnes's comment on the um um on the nuclear power yeah the this thing about um the the deposits of the waste which is absolutely absolutely true and the other is about an accident well we saw this with chernobyl uh, Chernobyl happened. Uh, was it back in the se late 70s? Because uh, I, I remember, I remember as a, I was a teenager at the time, and um, I remember the news. Yeah, 1986. So I wasn't a teenager. I was already um, well into university at that point. Um, but anyway, the point is, I remember the news, and uh, I remember the uh, the. <laughs> The primitive pre um, pre CGI graphics that people uh, used at the time it's uh, it's it's quite quite funny to think about it almost hand drawn graphs of the cloud of radioactivity and the um, I was in the UK and the uh, the there were reports of uh, the level of cesium radioactive cesium uh, being measured in the milk from cows in Scotland and in Wales. 
Okay, so it was, uh, it's like what we said about the airflows and the pollution. It doesn't respect it doesn't respect borders. Okay, so okay, so uh, thinking about flows, energy flows, um, we've we've had a look at this in brief before. Uh, so the primary energy flows that we will be thinking about are wind power, uh, solar radiation. Um, so that's the light from the sun. Um, also thermal radiation from the sun, so that's heat as well. Um, hydrogen, hydropower, not hydrogen power, hydropower, that's water, that's an easy one. And the last three here, which are very specific to particular places, so um, wave power, um, tidal power is particularly important where you have a big tidal range because there are some places in the world where <coughs> um, the difference between low tide and high tide is it can be really quite uh, quite big. Um, and then geothermal. So in places like uh, places like Iceland, but also some places in Italy, I know uh, there are some uh, geothermal. Um, uh, geothermal plants. This is extracting <coughs> extracting energy from volcanic activity under underground. Okay, um, let me. Yeah, I'm just going to move over. Okay, so um, thinking about <coughs> sustainability and renewability here, um, flows are typically associated with uh, sustainability because they replenish themselves under certain conditions, of course. Um, so I'm thinking about um, what's happening now in the west of the US, uh, but it's also being repeated <coughs> in other parts of the world where uh, hydroelectric schemes, hydroelectric dams are finding themselves um, almost unusable because there is not enough water. Uh, the water that there was when they were built, uh, because they were built in times when there was a sort of, let's say, a regular replenishing of the, uh, of the amount of water. So uh, the winter rains, the runoff in the mountains, goes down in the valley, gets trapped in the lake, and so on. Um, when the rainfall patterns change, the dam can become completely unusable and this is happening uh, in some places in uh, in Colorado and in the, the west of the, in New Mexico in the west of the US um, why do rain why do rainfall pattern why do rainfall patterns change um, rainfall patterns change because the climate is changing and the climate is changing because of uh, the energy distribution, the way energy is distributed through the Earth system is changing. Okay, so um, from something which is potentially renewable and sustainable, we get uh, something which may become unsustainable. Um, a curious case is the in unsustainable of some attempts to use geothermal energy. Um, where uh, it's been overexploited and it has uh, cooled down the uh, it's it actually <laughs> cooled down the, uh, the the source such that it's no no longer uh, no longer viable because it's been overexploited. Now, um, overexploitation is a uh, is a classic uh, is a classic um, a classic trait. Of, uh, of many uh, many systems okay so uh, the only the only thing here though is that while these things may be uh, important and uh, really present um, the their overall contribution is still rather small okay uh, yeah. Okay. So pa Paolo has just made a, a comment, another comment about nuclear. Um, in Italy, nuclear power stations are being decommissioned, and decommissioning 
it's like a, it's like as they say when you buy a puppy at Christmas, a, uh, a pet dog is not a puppy is not just for Christmas; it's for life. Um, a nuclear power station is not just for Christmas; it's for a long, long time. Um, and we yes, we buy nuclear energy from uh, we buy electricity, the currency. It you can't divide, you can't um, separate the uh, the the electricity you you get from nuclear from the electricity you get from something else it's just electricity it's the currency but it is uh, it is being produced by other countries who are using nuclear uh, nuclear energy in particular France I think okay so um, looking at renewable and sustainable um, I don't think it would be surprising to most people uh, the the countries that are at the top of the list, this list um, simply because they seem to be countries which are maybe more uh, environmentally aware but also uh, countries which are geographically more suited to in particular hydroelectric um, uh, hydroelectric uh, schemes actually the country which is uh, ahead here would be Norway, but Norway isn't in the EU member isn't an EU member state. So, um, and what you have is you have favourable geography uh, essentially. Um, surprising thing, or let's say an opportunity which I don't know whether it's an opportunity which is missed or which is not, or whether it's an opportunity which needs to be taken now, particularly with the new generations of technology. Um, solar so around the Mediterranean in particular Italy Spain um, how much how much has um, uh, how much how much have they taken advantage of the their favorable geography with respect to solar energy um, and that all, that also goes to to other countries I just happen to know a bit more about Italy and Spain um, in terms of solar energy so <clears throat> the point is that uh, there's a long long way to go yet this is from uh, this is the 2020 so this is 2018 so um, Italy, yeah, Italy's sort of met its target but uh, maybe the target wasn't so ambitious so anyway that's without getting into ah right okay yes um, another <laughs> another record cover some of you may remember this uh, this guy um, a very young uh, very young looking Bruce Springsteen um, the river so of course this is about hydropower um, this is a classic classic example and um, this is is quite clearly what do you need you need um, you need spaces which you can uh, which you can fill with water and then release that water um, when you need it uh, to control the amount of electricity that you, you produce because one of the things about um, one of the things about electricity in general is that whereas you can store oil and petrol um, you can store electricity on a small scale we have batteries we even have rechargeable batteries now but that doesn't work on a large scale and in fact that's one of the big technical limitations of electricity as a currency um, and it's one of the let's say one of the big areas of, uh, of, of technological research to try and um, uh, overcome that uh, overcome that limitation mm -hmm. um, so what are you doing here you're actually using the potential energy which is stored in this mass of water to uh, to drive a uh, to drive turbines um, the advantage of a dam as opposed to a river is that here you can have a, a lot you have a head of water and you can have a lot more um, you have a lot higher potential energy here whereas the the river will depend on the um, uh, on the flow and that will depend on the rainfall in the uh, in the river 
that will depend on the on the uh, the, ro- the rainfall in the in the river catchment uh, in the river catchment zone. Okay, about one sixth of the world ele- of world's electricity is directly generated by hydropower, which is actually a reasonable amount, but it does depend on geography. So some countries have uh, uh, have the right type of um, let's say the right type of geography which allows them to do this, uh, and some countries are able to. Um, have a much, or they they have a much higher uh, amount of hydropower in their energy mix, but that is not a general, uh, it's not a general rule. So let's just say, let's read in the correct according to principle. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so Agnes has sort of raised a point. Uh, I think I think you're talking about. Um, the idea of, of circular economy, um, which ultimately under, underneath it has this idea of uh, of, of the energy um, being used efficiently, because one of the things that we have to remember is that energy um, energy flows, um, but we can't we can't get it back. Okay. Once we've once we've wasted it, we've wasted it. So we need to be um, using uh, using it um, uh, efficiently. Okay. So um, one of the key problems with dams, of course, is that they are extremely destructive to ecosystem. Well, basically, they destroy ecosystems by flooding, um, change things completely. Um, and maybe in the past these were the sorts of um, considerations that uh, people wouldn't really take into uh, take into account simply because the advantage of the electricity far outweighs the uh, far outweighs the problem of destroying an ecosystem which no one sees and no one cares about. Um, But of course, what's happened over time is that uh, many of these big dam uh, projects have actually brought more problems than they have solved. Um, So I'm thinking about the, um, uh, when was it, August time this year in China, there there was serious flooding about the time of the floods in Germany. Um, But in China, the... uh, the number of people who were who had to be evacuated was something like a million people. It was a huge number of people, and the Chinese military actually destroyed at least one dam, if not two. They actually had to breach a couple of dams because, and these are these are huge these are huge structures, and the reason was that um, they were unable to control. Uh, they were unable to control the accumulation of, of water, so it's like one of those games where you start the game and it just gets out of hand. And uh, of course, this was something when the dam had been when the dams had been planned, they hadn't been they hadn't taken into consideration that the rainfall patterns could change for the worst. Okay, so. Okay, so coming back to the alternatives, this this idea of inf- inflow um, um, or in the river, run of the river system, run of the river flow, is simply that you put something in the river which is taking taking advantage of the flowing water, but it's not necessarily disrupting the flow of the water itself. Um, this has a disadvantage of um, potentially a regular um, river, uh, sorry, uh, water supply. Um, But I was just thinking about this and it just occurred to me that we actually have an example here in uh, in Verona, in our town here. Um, This is very close to where I live. Uh, It's the the, the dike at uh, Kievo and um, this was the construction, it's been re- renovated, but the construction, it was first made about a hundred years ago. 
and even a hundred years ago they were using it to generate a small amount of electricity um, basically what what you have is you have a a set of gates which are raised or lowered to control the the flow uh, in the river this is the river and it's sort of flowing down towards the town um, and this side this actually looks like a wall but it's not it's a grill and this goes to a generator um, so it's interesting because it's a the the, the engineer who who designed this had the intention of first of all managing the uh, managing the flow of the of the river to avoid um, destructive flooding in the town, but also to generate a little bit of electricity in, at the same time. So um, this is a, a curious example. I just realised that we had this next to next to where we live. Okay, so um, as far as greenhouse gases are concerned. Um, you can imagine that dams are actually not too bad. Um, the there is concrete. Concrete is greenhouse gas uh, heavy. In other words, it produces a lot of greenhouse gas. It produces a lot of CO2. However, you make a dam and it stays there for eighty, hundred years, more. Okay, so it's one of those things which are um, once it's built, once the uh, once the thing is is there, um, it can be relatively uh, relatively inexpensive over time, but also very 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 efficient. It can be a very efficient way of getting energy, um, and you know you can have well uh, some figures here the, compared to a. Uh, compared to a, a combustion engine, uh, nearly 100% efficiency of the flow being converted into the movement of the turbine. So this is this is potentially pretty pretty good stuff. Okay, now this is this is before my time. Although I do like this, this uh, I do like cream um, sunshine. <laughs> okay, so of course this is solar power. Um, different types of solar power. Uh, I think most of us are very familiar with these guys, the solar panels, okay, so, which is uh, photovoltaic. Um, now this is something which was uh, science fiction maybe about 50 years ago, um, simply because the technologies available to, um, to make the uh, the semiconducting silicon was extremely rudimentary, and it's within the last within the last 50 years, but particularly within the last 20 years, that this technology has become uh, incredibly uh, incredibly advanced. Um, the interesting thing about these this way of um, getting energy is that it doesn't require any mechanical parts so it's potentially potentially very very efficient um, however the uh, the efficiency of the conversion of the energy which hits the panel to the electricity um, is still only around about 20% in commercial um, uh, so the the efficiency is still pretty low. Um, there are always promises of new materials and uh, let's say better uh, better um, better materials uh, coming along, and almost certainly there will be. But we then get into another problem, which is um, the materials which are uh, used for um, just one second sorry sorry it's my phone was zooming um, the materials that are used for making this stuff is the same materials that are used for making chips in computers and there is a limited supply of um, there's a limited supply of, of high-grade uh, purified silicon. Um, there are relatively 
a uh, few places in the world that can do it to the level that's required and so um, the price of the photovoltaic panels can be prohibitive particularly for countries or places which would probably benefit most which is a bit like a, it's a bit of a contradiction in a way um, the ri rich northern countries can afford solar panels but they don't have the sun <laughs> okay um, okay so the the alternatives uh, so the f we've got photovoltaic effect but the alternative is using the heat from the sun um, so the sol solar thermal plants and I'll talk about that I think it's on the next slide um, but of course the other one is uh, much much more local which is using thermal energy from the sun to directly heat water for domestic use now this this is um, passive solar water heating and it relies on capturing the energy in water or in something which then transfers the heat to water um, you're not wasting time uh, trying to drive turbines or anything you're going to use the hot water okay so it's, it's very local it's per house let's say um, and it depends solely on the efficiency of retaining that heat so it's about insulation capturing an insulation um, whereas these two uh, the photovoltaic cells and the solar thermal power plants are about electricity and electricity as a currency means that you can do all sorts of stuff with it okay so um, let me just move on okay yeah th this is a little bit technical but basically what you're doing is you're getting you're getting the use the, the energy of the Sun is used to move the electrons around in the silicon in such a way that um, you get uh, potential and it's that potential which allows you to um, to drive a um, uh, to drive well to to power a light okay so it's an electrical potential it's actually separating the electrons okay um, no moving parts no turbines there's no machines you're not burning anything um, so, and one of the advantages here is you can put them all over the place uh, places which would normally be well, completely ignored like the roof no one goes on the roof everyone sort of sits in the building okay um, and particularly in industrial areas where you may have large factories large uh, and in fact uh, I've noticed going around here in the Veneto and also in Emilia Romagna that uh, many many factories now uh, industrial places do have um, solar uh, very extensive solar paneling um, okay this is a solar uh, thermal uh, power plant um, I think this one is actually in the south of Spain uh, if it's not in Spain it's in or it's in maybe in Tunisia but I think it's in, in the south of Spain basically um, these things here they look like sheep but they aren't they are mirrors and what they're doing is they are focusing sunlight onto this uh, tower and this tower is basically collecting this sunlight it's a bit like a magnifying glass and it's using this energy to generate steam to evaporate water and superheat steam so we tend to think of steam as being 100 degrees but it's not it can be a lot higher because it's just the vapor form of, of water so uh, you increase the temperature of it and the pressure goes uh, goes up and that allows you to um, drive turbines much much faster okay so this is a this is another use of solar but of course if we think about it here um, this is a field while well, it's a field it's a huge area which is just covered in mirrors now I don't know what sort of wildlife what sort of ecosystem there was there but I can see Carmen has put a, uh, a comment about um, 
uh, in which she says, in my region, there are lots of windmills, but what a terrible effect on birds moving. OK, um, I think if any bird flew through this, it would probably get fried. So um, that's not to let's say underestimate the uh, uh, the seriousness of the thing. But again, this is a type of approach which here you're talking about um, large scale energy generation. This isn't you, you don't have one of these in your garden. OK, whereas you may have solar panels in your garden. And one of the things with solar panels is they're scalable. OK, so. Um, so, yeah, OK, so that's uh, solar thermal. OK, and since Carmen was talking about wind, um, uh, we're going to talk about wind for a few seconds. Um, I don't know if anybody who does anybody know this album? Um, because if you don't, you should. This is one of the it's one of my <laughs> absolute favorite albums of all time. JJ Kale, naturally, um, and it's just a phenomenal piece of uh, phenomenal piece of uh, piece of music. Um, okay, so wind power. Um, these are well. If you go to northern Europe, you find them all over the place. Um, I a few years ago I uh, I went I spent some days at uh, uh, in the area of the UK where I grew up and I was very surprised to go to the seaside and um, see just offshore well it must have been a couple of kilometres offshore uh, uh, literally a wall a wall of windmills um, and. They are apparently they're planning more. Um, okay, so what's the what's the thing here? It's clear that you have wind, which is pressure differences, air moving between pressure differences, um, and this is going to drive uh, it's going to drive a blade, which is going to drive a turbine. Um, there are different factors involved in this. Um, what you what you want is not necessarily strong winds, um, but constant. You need something that's fairly constant. So um, the northeast of England is absolutely the place to be. Um, it was. Uh, it's always. <laughs> it's always windy on the North Sea, or most well, ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. Let's say um, the factors which will depend on the energy that you get out is uh, our wind speed, uh, the density of the air. Now, maybe that's something that we don't think too much about, uh, and the radius of the blade. I think these two make intuitive sense. Air density is maybe a little bit more technical, but it's actually very important because it explains why you don't really want to be putting these on the tops of mountains because uh, on the tops of high mountains that is because um, the denser the air the more mass more force it has and so you want uh, you want to be lower down where the air is uh, lower down where the air is denser um, the more force pushing on the blades the more the blades will turn um, and this is uh, th this is an example of one of those let's say technical things which um, maybe has never really been explained to people. They just see wind turbines being put up here and there and everywhere, and they don't really sort of uh, there's no real explanation as to why here and not not somewhere else. Um, The example is this, that the, the turbines are made to operate within a certain range of wind speed. So when the, re, when the, the breeze is very light, they won't turn. When the breeze is too strong, or when the wind is too strong, they won't turn. They will stop because they, they could break the, the turbine. Um, so what happens is the they have a 
they have a, a, a technology which allows them to, or they, they are made such that they will start to turn within a, a particular wind speed range. Um, but the interesting thing is this, that the, the output, in other words, the power you get from the, the blade turning, is not a simple relationship to the, um, to the, the wind speed. It's actually a cubic relationship. So if the if the wind speed if the wind speed doubles, you get eight times as much power, which is that's pretty good because it's an it's an amplifying effect. Okay, and so this in part will explain why uh, they are positioned in particular places rather than uh, other places. Um, Okay, so uh, okay, now this that, that's fine. I can move on from that. Okay, um, energy use. So it's just how, okay. So we've talked about energy currencies. Okay, um, and we've talked about how um, energy can be stored and moved around. Um, so here we were thinking about electricity. Um, which you can store to an extent in batteries, um, but it is nowhere near as transportable as something like oil or uh, hydrocarbon. Okay, now coming back to the music uh, and coming back to the the 1980s um, and coming back to our orchestral maneuvers in the dark because they seem to have <laughs> they seem to have uh, let's say had their um, uh, had their finger on the pulse at the time. Um, it, it's interesting, their song, you can find this on YouTube, and it's actually quite catchy, it's just I'm, I'm not allowed to show the video. So um, it's called Electricity. Um, it's worth, uh, it's worth, worth having a look at for, even if it's just for the 1980s haircuts. Um, but it talks about, um, electricity talks about one source of energy uh, all we need to live today a gift for man to throw away the chance to change has nearly gone now this is 1980s the chance to change has nearly gone the alternative is only one the final source of energy solar e electricity I, when I read these words again uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, I was thinking, good Lord, this is, it, it's like, it's like a voice from the past saying, ha, ah, I told you so. So anyway, so um, electricity, if we think about electricity as uh, a fundamental, uh, it's a fundamental um, uh, aspect of our society, um, we need everything just about everything runs on electricity um, we even burn um, oil to make electricity uh, because it's just just so useful um, we're not actually remember we're not actually we're not actually uh, consuming the electrons though uh, we're just it's just move we're just moving them around and we're taking the energy we're taking energy uh, from them okay so um, the the electricity uh, is coming from any one of a number of sources which we've uh, which we've talked about, but quite often we don't really think about where it's coming from. Uh, it just comes out of a, a a plug or a socket in the wall, and so. <clears throat> Um, the idea of, uh, of ele electricity generation, for example, from incineration of waste, which is a potentially a potentially um, useful way of getting energy out of something which would otherwise just be degraded in the environment. Um, this is a, a, a potentially contentious issue because uh no one really wants to be living next to a an incinerator um and particularly based on how we know these things have been managed in the past in many different places so um 
there is very much a uh, it's very much an, an out of sight, out of mind, and it's best not to think about it type of um, uh, type of thinking uh, mentality, um, and it, so. Uh, one of the things that we have to we have to bear in mind when we talk about uh, this, let's say, transition to um, um, a green economy or a green uh, a greener society, is that uh, we really do have to think about how much how much of this uh, energy we're actually using, because um, at the moment there is a um, how do you say? There's a the, the amount of electricity um, is that we're using is enormous, and it is still uh, it is st it is still increasing. So whatever we put in place has to be adequate to the um, to the to the needs. Okay, um, petrol is. Uh, said is a is a, a primary currency when we're talking about energy, um, and it's also used in um, it's also used in uh, as raw materials for chemical industries, uh, and that's everything from plastics to pharmaceuticals. Now, some of these things we'll talk about plastics. Uh, I think that probably next time. Looking at the time now, um, but the it's clear that uh, the use of petrol, the use of hydrocarbons is going to have to change. But the there are certain aspects that we will not be we will not be able to um, do without. Okay, um, I'm not sure whether this is really necessary here. This is just uh, something about crude oil. Okay, yeah, hydrogen. I wanted to say a few words about hydrogen. Um, on the musical theme, some of you may uh, remember, maybe not the first time round, uh, the uh, the album Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Um, this is a famous photograph. Well, it's a, a graphic from a photograph of the Hindenburg which is the Hindenburg disaster exploding at Lake Hurst in 1936 in, uh, in the US. Um, and why did this happen? Well, because the Hindenburg was full of hydrogen. And that sort of explains a little bit why hydrogen has never really taken off as a fuel, um, because it's extremely, extremely explosive. <laughs> In the sense that there's a lot of en you can get a lot of energy from it in the uh, in combustion with oxygen. What's the big advantage? Well, the big advantage is chemically it's great because you get water. You burn hydrogen, you get water. So um, essentially, if you can work out a way of splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, which doesn't involve burning a lot of oil to get the energy to do it, then you're on to something which could be potentially um, very useful. So uh, there are different ways of, that people are looking at uh, for handling hydrogen as a, as a fuel. Uh, one of these is the idea of the hydrogen fuel cell, which is a sort of, you can think, of, think about it as a sort of battery in a way, but it's... Um, it's controlling. It's keeping the, uh, the 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 hydrogen reaction with the oxygen under control in such a way that it actually generates electricity rather than um, rather than exploding, rather than as a as a direct combustion uh, reaction. Because as we know, the the combustion reactions are um, very inefficient. And you will waste a lot of uh, a lot of heat, a lot of energy um, during the combustion. So the idea of the of the fuel cell is uh, potentially much more um, enticing 
but it's also technically much more difficult. Okay, uh, a couple of words about how um, energy is divided um, across different sectors. So we can think of uh, think of sectors in uh, economic economic sectors in society. Um, we can think about <coughs> main um, the main sectors in using energy are transportation industry, and then we have a sort of a collection which is um, residential, commercial, institutional, agricultural, but together they are um, they are less than uh, the transportation, the industrial use of energy. So transportation, simply the movement of people around the place, uh, or the movement of goods around the place, uh, around the world, um, and it does need a lot of energy. And as we know, uh, a lot of this energy is derived simply from hydrocarbons. Um, transportation itself is not as it's not simply the train on the tracks, but it also does include the tracks, and it also includes how the uh, how the track and the train operates. So, if this may seem a little bit, let's say, off the track, off the target for, in talking about the environment. Um, I don't think it is because one of the things about environmental uh, thinking about environments and environmental thinking is thinking about systems, thinking about um, how things are connected to each other and the context that they're in. So in this case, we do need to think about um, the infrastructure, in other words, what is the transport running on? Um, the vehicles, what are they? Is it a train? Are we talking about cars? How are they operating? Is it private or is it public? Okay, so thinking about infrastructure, this is easy. Uh, it's the roads, it's the railways, it's the the airports, it's the um, uh, the tanker terminals or what have you. Um, but of course, this takes a while to build, and quite often it's built for a certain time, a certain epoch, and then it continues to be used, but it's no longer adequate. So one of the, I think one of the classic examples is, uh, I think we all know, or we will all have seen roads which were maybe built 40, 50 years ago, and when they were built they were fine, uh, and they were built for a certain amount of traffic, but now there's a lot more traffic. So uh, one of the examples a few years ago in Geneva was the, the collapse of the, of the bridge. And part of the reason, apart from the fact that there was no maintenance or little maintenance, uh, part of the reason was that the traffic had increased dramatically since the, the, the bridge had, had first been built. So um, this statement here, um, inadequate or badly planned infrastructure can cause um, just as many problems as it can as it can solve. Okay, um, vehicles themselves. Um, here you have uh, the 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 thing which is allowing the vehicle to, to move, so it's the engine, the motor, the propeller, whatever, um, and it will need fuel. If we think about the operation, um, most big cities have some form of public transport, um, but if you think about it, it makes perfect sense that uh, in a place where you have a, a large number of people in a small, in a relatively small area, if everyone if everyone got in their car to drive around it would just be uh, it just gets uh, the traffic just gets intolerable um, good example of that is Milan <laughs> or Rome the, the uh, ring road around Rome or, or London um, these are uh, these are places where there are far too many people to have everybody moving around in a in a private car, um, which is why when we're talking about uh, pollution, when we're talking about 
um, efficiency of the transport network, in which means efficient, efficiently moving people from one place to another, or helping getting people from one place to another. Public transport in cities is um, is extremely, uh, or public infrastructure, transport infrastructure in one way or another, is extremely important in. Uh, in addressing some of these uh, some of these problems, so uh, looking at a few uh, a few statistics here, um, where does the energy come from for transport? Well, it's mostly oil. You can probably expect that. Um, there's a bit of biofuels now. Uh, there's a bit of natural gas, which is methane. There's a bit of electricity, just a tiny bit of electricity, okay? We don't use coal, but it's basically hydrocarbons. We know this, and we know that this, this has to change. This is from 2015, and this is um, an illustration of the growth. So, um, If we look at the top graph, you can't see the words here, but this is uh, oil, hydrocarbons. Where do they go? Most of it is road. If you look at the transport system, most most of this is most of the the traffic on the road is using oil products, and you have some uh, domestic use and relatively small amounts of other things which are completely irrelevant. So this is where we need to be thinking about changing. Um, to illustrate the growth in transport, and I think I think we have a sense of this anyway, um, from 2000 to 2015, you can see that um, there has been a, a, a small increase in the amount of, well, actually it's a big increase compared to what there was because there wasn't anything. Um, the, the use of biofuels and such like, okay. Um, this is increasing, but of course at the same time, look at diesel. Uh, gasoline or petrol has increased too, but uh, diesel. And in Europe, certainly, this has been a result of the, um, the policies of taxation on uh, diesel, which make it cheaper to run a diesel car than it, it is to run a petrol car. And I know this because we, we, have, we have both in, in the house. And um, it, yeah, it's when you have this type of incentive uh, these are the things which do need to be do need to be seriously looked at. Okay, um, I realise that I've sort of waffled on a little bit. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stop there. So um, I've got we've got about five minutes for anybody who has a has any qu questions or comments. I've sort of uh, mangled things a little bit here, uh, but let me. Uh, let me just have a look. I just need to check. Where are we? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 We're we're sort of. I'll pick this up next time, and then we'll talk about the plastics. Okay. So, does anybody have any uh, any questions or comments? I don't know. Okay. So if you. If you feel, if anyone feels like saying something or sending a message on the uh, on the chat, that'll be that's okay. Any questions? Any comments? I think um, I think one of the I think one of the things which I think is uh, potentially um, useful when we're thinking about these things because the, what's the idea here? The idea is to try and get you to think about the the system, okay? 
so it's not just the it's not just the, that little piece, but it's the, the wider context because what we find is that um, you make a change here and something happens there, and it, things are this is all very very much in, interconnected, and we have to be very very careful about um, silo thinking, which is not seeing across the uh, across the whole situation. So the process of changing the proportion of nuclear energy is very slow. We greatly depend on it and this is the fact yeah. Well actually yeah I don't know whether I don't know where you are, Irina. Um maybe you are in a in a country which has um uh, a higher proportion of Lithuania. Ah, okay. So you probably have a high proportion, it's a relatively small country with a high proportion of nuclear, which gives you the advantage, but I, I can understand why, it gives you the advantage of energy uh, sovereignty, okay, so you're not dependent on other uh, sources of, of energy from other places. Um, probably we need to start thinking about a sort of reduction, of the, yeah, use of, I like that idea, uh, use Use and abuse of energy. Uh, that's an energy abuse. Sorry, yeah, yeah. That's uh, um, especially electricity in our uh, electricity in our everyday lifestyle. Um, you know, it, it's curious because the the world didn't have to become the way it has, in the sense that the first. The first technologies for moving away from uh, horse-drawn vehicles, because if you remember back in the late 1800s, 1890, there were no, there still were no cars, and there still were no, oh man, there were very few roads which cars could actually drive on. Um, it was still uh, very much people using horses. And so in big cities, um, use of horses causing terrible trouble, ter terrible problems, because, um, well, for serious re reasons, but simply because there were loads of them, just many, many, many horses. And you've all seen how much stuff horses produce. Uh, well, times that by a lot, and it, every day, and it was becoming a big problem. Um, and the first cars... Uh, the first cars to be proposed in, um, I think it was in Boston, but it may have been New York, were actually electric taxis. And the proposal was to create a network of electric ta because electricity was seen as the future. But then, around about that time, oil started to become cheaper and more than anything else, there were people like Rockefeller who had an intuitive understanding of how to put together the whole supply chain from drilling to burning it basically. And that gave the, gave the, gave the push, that gave the push to um, uh, to the, in, the 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 internal combustion engine, yeah, and so everything went from uh, everything went from looking at electricity as the future to burning oil as the future. Okay, right. So uh, okay, yeah, a use of especially electricity in our everyday life. Okay, how is it possible in the modern world of technology? Um, well, how is it possible? I think that's where we have to start thinking about what sort of ways we can um, we can use our energy more efficiently, what sort of ways we can change. And some of this is some of this must be personal change. We can't keep going on the way that we are the way that we have in the past. We will have to change change personal habits where we can. 
Okay. Now I'm not about. I'm not <laughs> proposing. I'm not proposing to um, impose um, cycling to work on everybody because no, not everybody can or wants to. But uh, we we have to start thinking about life lifestyle changes. I think, like serious lifestyle changes. Anyway, um, it's 18:31. So I hope uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to call an end to this. So I hope it's been useful. I hope uh, it's been interesting. Um, I apologise if I uh, if I waffle on a little bit, but uh, um, I, I will try to keep things more focused. Okay. So Agnese, do you want to do you want to close the session? Voicudera. Okay, yeah, yes, thank you everyone for being here. And I think that the, um, the car that you were, to, what, you were talking about was the Ford T. No, 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 it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. Uh, no, that came just a little bit, no, it just came just a little bit later. Um, it was something, it was by a guy that no one has ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the because it's it it fits with the the general idea at the time was that uh, the electric vehicles they have they have technical advantages over internal combustion engines, but the problem is always the bat it's always been the battery, and so the idea this guy had and it's a great idea was that you would have a fleet of taxis serving the city. And you would, there would be a certain number moving around, and there would be a certain number recharging. Okay, um, whether the recharging was replacing the battery or whatever, but there would be a certain number uh, um, moving, and a certain number, uh, and a certain number, um, let's say, uh, recharging. But uh, the idea was that it was a public transport, it was a type of public transport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Yeah, and at that point, uh, of course, when Ford came along, Ford had the idea of every man has a car, every person has a car, and that, you know, we get into sort of heavy duty capitalism and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Gordon. Okay, okay thank you. Time. And yeah. thank you, everyone. Have a nice yeah, okay, day. so ne next time, Prosim Avod, next time um, I'll start with the plastics, okay? So I'm a little bit behind, but that's, it's not a problem. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye, you all.